Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us on this afternoon's webinar, uh, Traditional Plant Restoration and Innovation. We're really happy to see so many attendees. This is one of our larger so far. Uh, that being said, we are featuring several panelists on this webinar. Um, so if you do have a question throughout the webinar, please plop it into that Q&A feature or send us a chat, indicate which particular panelist you would like to address with the question, or if you just have a general question, we'll do our best to address it as a team here. Um, I just want to do a, a couple of quick introductions. My name is Kelsey Ducheneau. I'm the Natural Resources Director for the Intertribal Agriculture Council. I'm an enrolled member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe up here in North Central South Dakota, um, working from home on the DX Ranch through COVID-19 and uh, working remotely. Really excited to be on the webinar here today with some incredible talent. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my colleague Kier and let him introduce himself and get the webinar underway. Hey everybody, uh, so glad you could join us. This is Kier Johnson Reyes. I'm an Osage Nation tribal member, work for Intertribal Agriculture Council out here in California, serving tribes in California, Nevada. Um, it's the Pacific Region Technical Assistance Specialist as well as the uh, National Technical Assistance Program lead. And we're on our way here. So we wanted to start off with uh, a couple of important announcements. Uh, Intertribal Agriculture Council is currently uh, you know, running a few initiatives nationally. We have a Native Farmer Rancher Loan Relief Initiative. Uh, we're asking tribal organizations, producers, tribal governments, and uh, general consumers to help to sign on uh, to a major initiative that we're uh, pushing uh, alongside uh, the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative housed at the University of Arkansas and the Native Farm Bill Coalition. Um, and so anyway, you can go to this uh, indianag.org slash farm, and, farm ranch help. Uh, let's see if I can do this for everybody right now. And um, you'll see down here on the, on the bottom of the page, different letters that have already been uh, generated that you can glean from, or you can um, basically just apply your uh, organization or companies or tribes, uh, you know, letterhead and, um, and sign. So it's a pretty straightforward process there. The other thing, oops, sorry about that. The other thing I wanted to bring up uh, that we're doing is, uh, you know, we're really asking producers, tribal community and, and community leaders, community grocers, food hubs, cooperatives, tribal food companies that may participate in American Indian Foods or interested in that to fill out a five minute survey um, the information is really uh, being utilized to inform our efforts to educate Congress as well as inform our partners uh, who are interested in designing, um, you know, opportunities to, um, you know, create grants for um, direct response to uh, some of the areas that are uh, covered in the survey. Uh, so with that, you just go to our front page of our website. And right on the front page, you've actually got both right on, our, on the front page right now. So here's the, uh, um, you know, support for the farmers and ranchers, kind of the loan relief element right there on front. And then the second section right here, share your stories. Um, we've got the different uh, producer survey, the tribal community leader survey. They're all right there. And so, again, we'd like to encourage you to do that. And we have, um, let's see, weekly drawings going on for the next couple of months. Uh, we're drawing uh, folks that have uh, participated in the survey. We'll have the opportunity to uh, possibly get selected for a $200 prepaid visa card. And uh, we're doing that every week for the next couple months. So again, please help to support that effort. Alrighty, and we're on our way. Let's see. So our agenda for today is, um, so let me pull this out of here. <clears throat> We're going to have a, a quick introduction uh, on the Environmental Quality Incentives Program uh, through the lens of uh, traditional plant management and um, the Southern California Tribal Liaison uh, and great colleague of mine, Pedro Torres, is going to provide us um, a little uh, background there. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about some project <laughs> examples uh, that NRCS uh, has implemented in coordination with tribal communities in California, as well as 
uh, Alaska, and I think that there's a few other project examples in there from other states as well. Talk briefly about uh, conservation planning for traditional plant management project uh, that we're doing here in California. And then we have some participants in that project, representatives from the Kashaya Band of Pomo Indians, as well as the Talawadani Nation, who will provide um, you know, brief presentations on their, uh, their individual projects. And then we have a little bit of resource information and then we'll have uh, hopefully some ample time to um, take questions uh, as well. And so we're um, really looking forward to continuing uh, to roll out webinars uh, within this subject area. So yeah, please do uh, follow up with us if there's any particular topic you'd like us to cover and we can get to work on that. So let's see. Alrighty, Pedro, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Kier, and uh, and thank you all for uh, for joining us and uh, allowing me to uh, talk to you a little bit about what uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service does. Um, you know, our motto is helping people help the land, uh, and we we work with landowners um, in, in voluntary programs uh, to help them address resource concerns in you know soil, water, air, plants, um, and animals. Um, you know, and, and, and the focus very much is uh, on the, uh, the, the concerns of the, the land manager, or, you know, in, in the case of the work that I do uh, as tribal liaison in Southern California, um, the tribes. Um, Kira, if you go to the next slide, um, talks a little bit about our, uh, the, the, the process. Again, we work, we work with the individuals um, to, to understand what their objectives are, um, look at all the resources available, Develop alternatives again with the uh, the landowner, um, and and work with them to make uh, decisions and evaluate how that plan is is working with uh, for the, the 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 individuals for their goals. Um, here you can move on to the next slide where I talk specifically about uh, the environmental quality uh, in incentives program. Um, this is our major uh, funding source. Um, you know. NRCS is primarily a technical assistance agency. Uh, we're founded in helping find uh, answers to difficult problems, um, but through environmental quality incentives program, we can also help uh, provide funds to get those problems on the, uh, those, uh, those solutions uh, and practices on the ground. Um, in California, uh, we have you know, focused our attentions for tribes in four specific areas and, and not uh, every state manages their tribal workload the same way. But in California, we saw that these were four areas, um, diversified farms, uh, traditional plant restoration, and, and those are two uh, agricultural landscapes that we only work on with tribes, um, tribal forestry and, and tribal rangeland. Um, you know, these were specific areas we saw of concern to, to tribes where uh, they didn't have the same concerns as their uh, private land counterparts and so we developed this way of uh, channeling equip funds to specifically work uh, with tribes. Um, I think in the future we'll hear a lot more about uh, conservation stewardship program um, but uh, Kira just asked me to specifically focus on equip uh, and that's where the uh, examples that we're going to get into here um, are uh, were, were funded by. Um, yes go ahead and Looked like Kira had taken my cue because I saw the little arrow go to the uh, to the thing there in the bottom. So, um, you know, the first example, uh, you know, this was again we we were looking at a traditional plant gathering area. Um, the area had been a, an avocado grove, uh, and and the avocado grove had been abandoned. The were dying. Uh, the the property had been completely overtaken by uh, invasive plants, and the tribe wanted to return it to a more native setting with a specific focus on. Uh, traditional use plants for, for food and fiber and NRCS provided funds for uh, a well for irrigation uh, as well as for planting and and removal of many of the invasive species. Here you can move to the next one and this is in Southern California San Diego County with the Kumeyaay people and then in the way uh, other end of the state um, Maidu folk in, in Northern California uh, you know uh, fire is a really sensitive issue in California. Um, we've been working really hard in the state to, to better be able to assist tribes in doing prescribed burns, especially cultural burns. Um, 
this was a few years ago uh, and we weren't able to help with the actual burn process, but we were able to work with the tribe to do uh, a lot of the pre-burn practices that allowed them to be able to go in and do their cultural burning uh, to maintain their, their traditional oak for, uh, for acorn, which is a traditional food uh, here. You can, um, so this is uh, you know, way on the other side of the, the country from us, um, but another great example of you know, traditional uh, uh, ecological knowledge uh, and, and looking again at the specific resource concerns of tribes. Um, wild rice establishment, very the Chippewa tribes of w Wisconsin. Um, and, and NRCS had to be a little creative in how we could utilize practices for uh, cultivation of essentially a, a, a wild plant. And we looked at you know, wetland wildlife habitat and the restoration management of declining habitats uh, to, to look at not just reestablishing the uh, wild rice for the tribe, but also uh, the other benefits that, uh, ecological benefits that um, could be gained from that. And then for my last slide, uh, looking at, in the southeast there, um, then with the Narragansett tribe uh, of Rhode Island, um, and looking at using our practices of uh, conservation uh, crop rotation, uh, and 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 just looking at through at it through the lens of the tribe and utilizing their traditional three sisters cropping system, um, and recognizing the uh, important. Uh, um, environmental values of that cropping system. Um, but again, looking at our practices through the lens of the tribe so that the, the tribes could uh, apply those practices on the ground and NRCS could help with uh, the financial assistance for that. And I think that's all you get from me. So I think it's going over to, to Christy over there, Christy Harper in, in Alaska. Christy, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Great. Go ahead. Thanks. All right. All right. Um, I'm Christy Harper, the uh, NRCS Alaska Native Liaison. Um, and I work in the Palmer State Office. And I just wanted to highlight kind of one of our, uh, uh, I guess, bigger uh, practices with, within EQIP that, uh, you know, enhances some traditional uh, plants for us. Next, there we go. Um, so up here in, in, in Alaska, we have everything from your, your uh, agriculture, dealing with gardening, high tunnels, raised beds, uh, hayland pastures, um, to something more unique. Um, it, it, as you can see in the lower right there, some of our practices are, are designed to benefit uh, our traditional plants, um, specifically some trees, forestry practices, and uh, as you can see here, the, the lady picking some, some berries um, as a result of opening the uh, overstory. Okay. And through, up here in Alaska, we utilize primarily EQIP, as uh, mentioned here before. Um, we've also been able to utilize the uh, Regional Conservation Partnership Program pretty effectively and um, <clears throat> and uh, we've had some pretty successful projects with that. We've also utilized the Joint Chiefs Landscape Restoration Initiative and all three of these programs we've been able to kind of leverage partnerships. Okay. So specifically we've uh, in Southeast Alaska, uh, we obviously use forestry quite a bit because that's uh, that primary um, uh, resource down there. Uh, we work with Alaska Native Corporations, we've, uh, the city, state, uh, and individuals, and together they've been able to, to achieve, um, you know, about 60,000 acres of thinned, 9,000 acres of slash treatment, and 2,800 acres of pruned. Okay. As mentioned before, we've, uh, it, it, doesn't just take one person, one private landowner. We've worked in partnership with other entities throughout the state. Uh, some of them are listed here, such as Trout Unlimited, State of Alaska, and the Forest Service. Uh, Kassan is a federally recognized tribe. 
uh, worked in conjunction with the Mental Health Trust. Uh, Gold Belt is an Alaska Native corporation, um, worked in conjunction with the, the University of Alaska and Southeast. So in Southeast Alaska, cedar is uh, heavily um, used and in the past it was, it was definitely a highly sought after um, product. Um, so there's a lot of clear cutting in the area, a lot of just total devastation of, of yellow cedar. So NRCS was able to come in and work with Alaska Native corporations to help regenerate and reinvigorate existing stands of yellow cedar. And in this particular uh, instance, they worked with the University of Alaska Southeast to assist in this project. So some of the uses of, our, of yellow cedar here, obviously, um, in the construction of some of the Clinkett and Haida's longhouses uh, there in Southeast, as you see in the center, and uh, the, I guess, the world-renowned uh, totem poles, as you see on either side of the longhouse. And some maybe of the lesser unknown uses of yellow cedar would be kind of there in the left picture where there's a uh, hanging what appears to be like necklaces but um, more, they're designed for deer calls uh, and then the kind of lower right in that same picture is uh, bent wood boxes and to the far right uh, is my aunt uh, holding a, a yellow cedar bark hat which uh, you know, traditionally they, they try to peel the bark off of cedars uh, just as the sap is starting to, to go up the tree. And I think that's it. Yep. Thank you so much, Christy. Uh, well, great. So I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> a project that we're doing down here in California uh, with conservation planning for traditional plant management. Um, you know, initially uh, what I wanted to just share is uh, that um, I think a lot of the California natives on the call uh, would agree that, you know, these are the ag products of, of these areas. Um, you know, these are examples of, um, you know, uh, fiber and food that uh, are gleaned from, you know, the traditional plants of the, of the ancestral territories of the peoples over here. And, uh, you know, when we think about agriculture, we might think about, um, you know, cows and plows in, in certain contexts, but, you know, there's um, a lot of California natives that continue to teach me and educate me about, um, you know, what they consider their agriculture, you know, to be. And um, a lot of these products here, um, you know, we've got brushes for, um, you know, acorn processing and teas and, you know, various, uh, you know, one of the traditional caps up there um, at one of our, uh, wonderful presenters uh, uh, lent to us in terms of uh, the photo there. So anyway, just uh, wanted to frame that. In the traditional plant management uh, project here in California is really looking at the conservation planning processes that this agency, Natural Resources Conservation Service, carries out uh, when uh, tribes approach them to uh, look into opportunities for managing for traditional plants and, and utilizing traditional practices. And so there's been, you know, four sites established throughout the state um, that kind of represent the, the spread of uh, various climates across the, the state. And we're looking at um, the planning process and having tribal staff and uh, traditional gatherers as well as, uh, you know, land managers and partners um, you know, work with NRCS through their planning process and the tribal partners are going to be writing up um, reports on how that process lends to traditional management and the goals that they have for, um, you know, the, the carrying out their responsibilities to their land. So uh, the project is um, wrapping up in the next year or so and uh, we have two uh, great um, partners in the project, uh, folks from uh, the Kashaya Band of Pomo Indians, um, let's see, north of San Francisco, as well as um, the Talawadani Nation, which is uh, a nation on the tip, tip, tip uh, corner, western corner of, um, of California. Just, you can see the Oregon border from their, uh, their community there, and Smith River. So um, I'm going to turn it over uh, first to representatives there at uh, Kashaya. And I think I have 
Abby and possibly Nina on uh, on the webinar here. So, Abby, are you there? Can you hear me? Yep, can hear you. All righty, the floor is yours. Um, so I'm Abby, and I'm the Water and Environmental Technician for Kashaya Band of Pomo Indians of Stewart's Point Rancheria. And just a little bit about the tribe. Um, we're um, a coastal tribe um, located in the Redwood Forest Belt of Northern California, Sonoma County. And our tribal population is um, a little over a thousand members, 80 of 100 to which live on our reservation. And um, our Aboriginal territory, it extends some 30 miles along the Sonoma County coast. Um, and the name Kashaya, it comes um, from people from the top of the from the top of the land, or it means um, expert gamblers. Mm -hmm. um, tribal lands, um, um, Stewart's Point Ranch, which means Huckleberry Heights, um, due to the um, high predominance of huckleberries in the area. Um, it was established in 1916, and the total acreage for that um, is 41.85 acres. And you can see on the map, um, it's the upper um, right-hand parcel, the smallest one. Um, and then in 2013, um, the tribal members, um, they agreed to forgo um, all or portions of their per capita payments provided by um, to non-gaming tribes, um, and they were able to purchase another 510 acres directly adjacent to the rancheria. And that was put into trust in 2015. And then most recently, um, in 2016, with the help um, from the Trust for Public Land and funding from the California Coastal Conservancy, um, Sonoma County Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District, and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, able to reacquire 678.2 acres of coastal property. Um, within their abor Aboriginal territory. Um, and so in a relatively short period of time, we went from 41.85 acres um, all the way to 1,230 acres. And not only does this um, restore Kashaya's connection to the coast, but it also provides an opportunity for the tribe to uh, manage lands in a way that promotes traditional land management and um, reintroduces on those techniques onto the landscape. Next slide. Project, um, the focus has been on the Kashaya Coastal Reserve, um, which is home to um, redwood habitat, closed cone pine cypress, perennial and annual grasslands, um, 79.5 and you can see in the map, there's four major grasslands located on the property. Um, and it is the goal of the um, tribe to increase the resiliency of these plant communities by introducing land manage management techniques and practices that promote the establishment of native species and optimizes the natural resources necessary to sustain wildlife. And then Prior to tribal ownership of this property, um, it was managed for cattle grazing, sheep grazing. Um, so these historic land management practices um, that focused on grazing and timber production, they largely overlooked the importance of biological diversity. And so it's expected that NRCS and Kashai work together to develop a conservation plan that um, incorporates tribal values and resource concerns um, to encourage traditional plant management. Next slide. Um, and so project development and working with NRCS. Um, the project has been moving forward um, since 2018 when we had our first discussions with NRCS and IAC. Um, and during that time, there have been staff changes on both sides, but um, we've been moving forward. Um, and overall, our experience working with NRCS has been well received. 
Um, and um, it's been a learning experience for both parties involved. Um, in 2019 and this year, um, NRCS conducted field visits to establish a plant inventory of grasslands on the Kashiro Cools Reserve. Um, and the tribe, it outlined specific plants of cultural significance um, to be on the front um, during these surveys. Um, and, and a company and um, tribal staff were able to accompany NRCS um, on these surveys. Some of the species um, identified were coastal lupin, lupin um, peppergrass, and different varieties of clovers. Um, and we're still wrapping up these surveys um, right now. And we are also planning on conducting a resource inventory and identification of resource concerns prior to development of the conservation plan. Um, but some of the main goals for the property are to um, restore upland forests to a late seral stage and also restore coastal prairies. Among those uh, initially identified um, by the tribe um, included fuel buildup due to um, poor forest management and also uh, reduced grassland habitat caused by encroaching plant species such as the bishop pine. Uh, and historically, indigenous burnings um, used to maintain these fuel loads and maintain these grassland habit habitats. So that's something we're also maybe looking into reintroducing into the uh, landscape, um, indigenous burnings. Um, but I think that's where we're at right now. I don't know if, um, Nina, you have anything else to add? Sorry, I had to figure out how to unmute myself. Um, hi, my name is Nina. I'm the Director of Environmental Planning for the Kashai Band of Pomo Indians. And I think Abby covered everything wonderfully. <clears throat> I would just add, uh, since it's not really part of NCR, NRCS, but with the plan being developed and with the grassland management plan, it'll be added to a larger of a basically a bigger conservation plan for the coastal reserve because it is in a conservation easement with Sonoma County Open Space District. We are in the process uh, of, we have a forest, we have a forest management plan and process that's in the final stages of being approved. And that will be added to the grassland management. So there's gonna be larger things attached to this, or this is gonna be attached to larger things. They're gonna to work together. <laughs> uh, and we have a timber harvest plan that will actually be happening this year and so we are interested to see how um, the changes are going to complement each other and knowing how we want to manage the grasslands is going to help us as we manage the forest lands because even the forest lands we have, um, we do have some fuel buildup that needs to be reduced. But watching what's going to happen with this property as we put Kashaya traditional knowledge into it. Um, excellent covering everything. Thank you, Abby. And that's just um, our contact information. Great. Thank you both, uh, Abby and Nina, for uh, the time and effort and, and signing on today. Really appreciate it. And we might have some questions uh, that we're going to take care of at the end of the uh, presentation time frame here. So uh, please stay on if you can. OK. Let's see. Cindy and Erica, are you on? Yes, we're here at CURE. Yep. We'll turn it over to you all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Delahan, this is Cindy Ford. I am the Habitat and Wildlife Manager for the Talawa Dene Nation. Um, I also, Erica, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, Delahan, my name is Erica Parti, and I'm the Natural Resources Director for the Talawa Dene Nation. We also have another employee on, she doesn't have a microphone, but I just wanted to acknowledge Elena Cisneros is our tribal resource specialist. So um, we're happy to be here, here and share today. Uh, the first slide you're looking at is just a, a very brief um, history of kind of our land. Um, the Talawa Dun or the ancestral land is located along Northern California and Southern Oregon. Uh, the southern boundary is Wilson Creek, and the northern boundary is Sixes Rivers. Um, so we, we straddled the Oregon-California border and, and had quite a vast um, 
ancestral territory. In 1853, at contact, the Talawa experienced the second largest recorded massacre in American history. So um, we had a, you know, a major interruption in our, in our uh, population as well as our practices. And then just real quickly to go through, you know, we were originally um, given a 17,000 acre reservation in 1862. That was null and you know, voided in 1868 by the United States government. In 1908, we were again uh, allotted 160 acres known as the Smith River Rancheria. And that was uh, terminated in 1960 where we lost all but a few individual um, holdings of land. But today, we're happy to say that we have, you know, more than 700 acres of land back in tribal ownership and control and over 1,800 tribal citizens. So we consider ourselves a thriving culture. And then I think here we can go to the next, the next slide. Um, so we were very honored to be selected to be part of this traditional plant management pilot um, program and I kind of got techie on the slide, but just a overview is the purpose of um, uh, the agreement was to expand the scope of NRCS conservation planning and approaches on tribal lands to be more inclusive of traditional forms of land management for foods, fiber, and other cultural products. Uh, the objective for us was to provide funding dedicated to the development of formal recommendations to enhance the applicability and cultural responsi responsiveness of NRCS conservation plan processes um, in traditional ecological knowledge management context. So that is a lot of words, <laughs> but um, basically we, we were presented this opportunity and we're really excited to be part of it. And um, with those two goals and objectives in mind, we developed a stakeholder group. And um, for us that consisted of tribal citizens who are active practitioners of um, you know, harvesting plants, gathering, hunting, and our government and our staff. And we were able to sit down and kind of identify what, what were our goals um, for traditional plant management. And the project we selected, um, you can see a little picture to the right is just a Google Air photo, but um, mm -hmm. the land is called Erchkani, and it is right in the middle of our community. Um, and it, it, it's a small um, area, but it's extremely culturally significant and spiritually significant to us. So we kind of came up with our definition of, um, you know, what our goals were and what is our definition of traditional plant restoration, which was to return to traditional management practices for native plants and wildlife habitat. Traditional plant restoration will be for food, medicine, and basketry or dye materials, as well as to improve um, local access for our citizens to, to practice their culture and uh, reestablish wildlife. So we were really excited to do this. Um, and kind of similar to the previous project, we have been doing um, bio inventories on the area for the you know 2019 and even into 2020, um, identifying what plants are desirable for us because just because they're native doesn't mean they're desirable. We have a huge poison oak problem here. <laughs> So we're, we're designing some best management practices um, that will help us to, to achieve our project goals, which is to um, use you know, our concerns, our conservation concerns are for, on this rock specifically, we have the huckleberry hazel for um, weaving, several ferns, and, and different other um, uh, medicines or teas that are available. So we're focusing on the health and uh, those plants and identifying which conservation practices match um, our traditional forms of plant management. And then we actually were able to kind of enhance this traditional plant management project with a trails assessment um, to make the, the original trail on this area a little bit safer and, um, you know, deal with some erosion concerns. And that's where we are in the project right now is waiting for some technical assistance uh, through engineering to, to identify the trail enhancement uh, concerns. And I think you can go to the next slide now, Kier. So for us, um, kind of just putting together helpful hints, um, 
education. This has been a learning process, like Abby said, for, for both the tribe and NRCS. It's been a very positive learning process. But, um, you know, first steps is to definitely sit down and understand what the NRCS conservation planning steps are, um, what resources are available, both tribally and through NRCS, um, understanding and identifying what staff will be involved. And also timelines because um, you know NRCS has their timelines, but our our tribal government and procedures also has timelines. And so one thing I've learned is to be able to um, you know know ahead of time what those deadlines or batching periods or you know council meetings, uh, committee meetings that you might have to go to are so that you can have a um, clear clear process. Um, project scope accomplishable. We, we started originally with this, you know, area of land that we own that's 400 plus acres and realized that, you know, it was a lot more needed to go into that. And that's what brought us back to this smaller area is, is make it accomplishable um, and, and, and something that you can really work through, identify your objectives and what your concerns are, and then, then implement those. And then uh, next is communication and coordination. And I kind of have several different things, but definitely community support. And for us, that was identifying our tribal stakeholder, um, who they were. And like I said, it was the citizens, it was the government, it was the staff, and really having everyone on the same page to um, provide input, um, provide expertise, and then to support the project to be followed through on. And that has been critical to us accomplishing this project. Um, definitions, I, I say, and here you kind of touched on this a little bit, um, really what this has been is, is kind of um, speaking Palawa and speaking NRCS. So traditional yeah. conservation practices don't always necessarily um, match what our, our tribal agriculture looks like. But when you sit down, you can be creative and, and you learn to, um, to um, speak each other's languages. And, and you'll find that a lot of the practices that NRCS does provide uh, do match traditional forms of plant management. You just you just have to learn to speak each other's languages. So take some time to do that. Um, it's worth it. And then regular check-ins for us. Uh, we we are in a very rural area, so we there has been a lot of turnover in in RCS staff up here and vacant positions. But we have worked through that by by keeping you know the project on the calendar and having check-ins um, with NRCS. We actually do a monthly phone call since we can't always travel and be with each other, and it's about a half an hour at the beginning of each month just to update each other and find out where we are on a waiting list or what um, has been accomplished and what the next steps might be before we get back together in a month. So that I think is super important. Um, to keep in touch and, and put it on your calendar and dedicate the time to it. And then I, that's about it for me here. I don't know if Erica wants to add anything in. You know, Cindy, I thought that was a really um, good summary of the project. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I, I think you covered most of it. Um, you know, we did get started with NRCS through the Diversified Farms Equip program. So it was a little bit different, but it was, honestly a pretty good introduction um, to the world of NRCS for us and kind of let us go through that. And the initial paperwork process is pretty long, so don't, you know, get overwhelmed by that. But I think, you know, some lessons that we learned throughout that and then this traditional plant management um, you know, definitely as you're looking at which practices you might want to do, one thing we learned was to check the payment rates on those. Um, you know, we've, we've pushed practices through before on the diversified farm side where it turned out that the reimbursement probably wasn't worth the, the time that we put into getting those practices established and into the plan. Um, but then also we've been able, NRCS is just a really great agency to work with and their staff is very flexible and will help you make practices fit your project like Cindy was saying um, and, and help you learn to speak NRCS you know and they've even helped us on one ag project that we were doing to the extent of using equip practices 
for a project that we were conducting on land we didn't own. Um, and so, you know, I would say if that's a situation you're facing, you can maybe talk to your representative about that. Um, but no, I think that that's, that was really good. And thank you. And if anybody has any questions, yeah, feel free to reach out. Our contact information's up on the screen now. Thank you both so much for your time and what you shared today. All righty. So, uh, Kelsey, you back with us there? Yep, I sure am. We wanted to make sure and include in today's presentation a quick, uh, you know, brief rundown on the resources offered by Intertribal Ag Council as it relates to conservation and resource management support. We will be unrolling here in the next few weeks a regenerative grazing initiative that we're very fortunate to be um, putting out there through some funding from Cedar Tree Foundation. Uh, this is going to be a regenerative resource management plan development uh, initiative where we're working with tribal producers, tribal land stewards to transition from regenerative, or sorry, from, you know, agricultural practices into more regenerative ag practices. What we're most excited about is that that's genuinely what indigenous land stewardship is, is it's finding a way to enhance the land and to always give back to land and make sure that it, you're leaving it better than you found it. So we're excited to really capitalize on this partnership with Cedar Tree Foundation to start to tell the story of some of our indigenous land stewardship practices and really express outwardly what some of those regenerative resource management practices look like when they're built into a regenerative ag plan. We're also going to be establishing and supporting a national learning and mentorship network through the development of this initiative, conducting outreach webinars and once they're safe and until then online webinars and doing virtual consultations. Eventually, we'd like to build into this some internship opportunities so that we can reach out to young professionals um, that are interested in engaging in this level of knowledge based development and doing some in house internships hired and contracted through Intertribal Ag Council and then also identifying some host locations, whether it be a tribal land enterprise or a different land base uh, organization management sort of technical assistance organization that would uh, be interested in hosting an intern or if it's going to be a blending we really want to use our internship opportunities as a way to enhance the professional development capacity of the individuals involved of course we're always especially through times of covid building out online curriculum. Um, we are going to be making an announcement here in the next week or two about an online curriculum platform where we will continue to build out these resources and tools for um, our membership and community members across the country. And of course we have to, you know, give credit where credit is due and recognize the resources from the partners that are across the country partners at home, which you all are able to interact with. Our tribal land stewards, tribal members, and tribal offices genuinely always have the best interest of the land and of the resources at heart. And we need to figure out ways to bridge these gaps and enhance these conversations between community members and, and land stewards and tribal governments. IEC is always here to support and liaison some of those communications when fit please reach out to us if you need assistance with that. And start to question what opportunities exist with the different agencies as it relates to conservation and uh, traditional plant restoration. We were able to hear from a lot of what how natural, uh, the Natural Resource Conservation Service is able to support and contribute to this effort. Um, also look into the different agencies that exist, whether it's with the United States Department of Agriculture or um, reaching out to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and, and figuring out what resources and opportunities are there. Uh, we found that until you ask, you don't really know what all exists. And once you finally know what all exists, you're gonna be able to kind of expedite that restoration process. There's also nonprofit organizations and grassroots organizations in the mix as well, uh, such as ourselves, the Audubon Society, Kavira Coalition. These are some of our national partners 
we also recognize that you know everybody would do as much as they could for the land if they could afford to and some of these restoration and conservation implementation practices do have a financial planning component reach out to local community development financial institutions and uh, different lending financial institutions and figure out if they um, are knowledgeable of any restoration driven funding opportunities keep an eye out for our different foundations so, and see tree foundation find ways that you can help to generate and inspire more um, aggressive approach to conservation and land stewardship and then recognize that there are some for-profit organizations that have valuable tools that are worth the investment whether that's uh, attending a ranching for profit class investing in a management tool such as pasture map looking towards more expertise or, or gaining experience and networking through organizations like Kiss the Ground or attending a national conference such as the Grass-Fed Exchange. Um, we're always happy here at Intertribal Ag Council to establish partnerships on a national level and a local level that will encourage and increase land stewardship of tribal lands. So if you know of more organizations or you represent an organization that has an opportunity you think should be included in this list, please reach out to me. I'd love to communicate and engage in those conversations to figure out how we can continue to enhance our opportunities to better serve our land stewards. Thank you very much, Kelsey. Okay, get McQuillan, are you on the line? Uh, he's the tribal liaison for Northern California and might have a few uh, parting words before uh, we turn it over to questions. Yeah, I'm here. Kier, you can uh, give me control and I'll share my screen. If you like. Let's see. Courtney, are you able oh. to help share the screen there? But that's not important. Um, my name is Tigat McQuillan. I'm a tribal liaison in Northern California, Pedro Torres uh, counterpart. And I just wanted to touch on um, that those were uh, awesome projects and I was really um, fortunate to be able to hear about uh, how those are moving forward. And I just wanted to uh, say that uh, NRCS is uh, always available to help with uh, those large projects but nrcs was founded on technical assistance and like uh, pedro said earlier uh, we're we're kind of experts at uh, solving problems um, you know any group or individual that has a natural resource management um, you know question concern um, problem we're uh, here to help uh, we are often asked, what is this plant? And that's definitely um, appropriate uh, technical assistance that we can provide. NRCS has 11, about 11,000 employees. So we have a lot of different expertise, uh, including in agronomy, uh, aquaculture, uh, recreation, uh, and lots more. We have certain programs that are specifically for uh, technical assistance uh, through our conservation technical assistance program where we provide proven conservation technology uh, we uh, a lot of states have technical committees that uh, advise our usda um, on uh, how we're implementing uh, natural resource conservation we also, especially even uh, here in California, we have our tribal advisory committee. Um, other states have other forms that uh, have the tribes um, help us better serve the tribal communities. Uh, we're serving 562 federally recognized tribes across the nation and many, many more non federally recognized tribes. There's about 150 tribal liaisons with NRCS and about 45 full-time and 30 part-time field offices on tribal lands. Uh, we also have uh, national level partnerships with different groups like the National Association of Conservation Districts, 
National Association of State Conservation Agencies. Um, and uh, you know, we uh, partner with tribal conservation, resource conservation districts. Uh, like we have one tribal conservation district um, complete here and others in process here in California. And uh, larger tribes like the Navajo tribe have six tribal conservation districts. Uh, so there's uh, lots of levels to work with NRCS from large projects down to you know, what is this plant. So uh, our doors and our telephone lines and emails are always open. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Kaget. All righty. Well, uh, we definitely want to uh, utilize the remaining few minutes here for any questions and absolutely encourage you to reach out to us directly if we, for whatever reason, don't have time to get to your question or if something comes up for you in uh, you know, the next few days, weeks, or months. I mean, we're, we're here for you. So um, let's see, I want to go ahead and uh, move this towards the question section. Oh, I'm he hearing someone. Go ahead. We did have one question come in, which I, I typed an answer out to. The question was if there was going to be a recording of this webinar once it's finished. Yes, all of our webinars are saved as a recording and published onto our YouTube channel, which you can find by searching Indian Ag, all one word, just like our email, in the YouTube search engine. Um, and it's also in the Q&A chat box if you would like to follow the link to find our YouTube channel and subscribe, then you would be notified of the recordings as they are posted. Another question was um, for the sharing of the slides. Um, go ahead and reach out directly to us um, via email and we can get a copy of the slideshow to you once we have um, the permission of all of the attendees. There's another question that came in from Samantha. Do people find it hard to source native plants for their restoration projects? Would one of the panelists like to comment on this? Hi, this is Erica Parti um, with the Talua Dini Nation. You know, we we do have trouble up in our area sourcing native plants. We actually don't have any native plant nurseries within our county. So, you know, as as much as you want to infer from that, we're having to go to kind of adjacent counties to get native plants for our projects. But, um, you know, identifying that as a need, we're actually in the process of starting our own native plant nursery to meet some of those needs for ourselves and agencies in Del Norte County. And, you know, I would say wherever you are, you're probably facing different situations for sourcing plants. But, um, you know, if you know what you're going to be needing, there's, there's always the option to look into how to propagate those and grow them yourself. And, and we think that, you know, by doing that, we're going to end up with plants that are going to do better for our projects because they're going to be more locally sourced, you know, coming from directly either the properties or the area where, where we'll be using them ultimately. So. Absolutely. And I'll just add on to that. You know, I've seen universities, tribal colleges, and, you know, even local uh, for-profit or nonprofit community-based greenhouses that have been happy to accept orders for the propagation of plants. Um, it's an additional uh, revenue stream for them. And, and often if there is the greenhouse space, they uh, may even just allow you to come in and propagate um, on your own to continue to reduce the cost of the restoration project. So start to think about what resources and opportunities do exist within your community as far as how to grow them locally and, and you, for any economic impact that that does result in on the project, you'll at least be able to keep that dollar local. This is Kier. Yeah, one thing I'd add there is uh, a lot of us on the call would know that uh, locationally derived uh, 
sources is uh, most important for uh, working in native plant restoration. And uh, so one thing to consider is looking at uh, developing partnerships with um, the entities that Kelsey was just referring to, local colleges, universities, tribal colleges, native plant society, um, you know, to train staff or train individuals on gleaning techniques as well as um, techniques for identification. Um, it's really, there's been some really neat projects out here in California where um, locationally specific uh, varieties have been gleaned uh, from uh, tracts of land that had very, very few of that particular plant's population. And, um, you know, through a, a propagation effort over, you know, six months to a year, being able to, you know, um, quadruple and then some, um, you know, those particular uh, plant species on onto specific sites. So, um, you know, just looking at creative solutions there and, and really exp extending the tent, so to speak, to include other partners is really, really important. There's a lot of mutual uh, opportunities out there, I think, um, you know, to kind of extend across aisles and work with various agencies, organizations, and, and universities towards this effort. And, um, you know, state, uh, you know, highway system uh, agencies are other great partners, like in California, there's the Caltrans uh, network. They're, um, believe it or not, very interested in sourcing native plant materials and working on native plant projects, BLM. Uh, you know, there's various agencies that are out there for, uh, that could be really great partners. This is Kegat. Uh, I wanted to add that the NRCS has uh, about 25 uh, plant material centers across the nation in uh, ecologically distinct uh, climates and regions. Um, the nearest to uh, the Talua Dani Nation would be the plant material center in Corvallis, Oregon, because um, the uh, California plant material center is in. Lockford, California, in a quite a different uh, eco region. So those are always a, a great resource for educational um, native plant materials and other collaboration. Thank. Thank you. There was a question um, from Gaylene. This is for NRCS. Can you clarify when individual recipients receive funds for row covers, fencing, et cetera, for projects? I've been trying to encourage my peers to apply for projects, but they are discouraged because they cannot afford to front the funds and then be reimbursed later. Pedro, are you on the line still? I am. I apologize. It took me a minute to get the uh, the unmute button. Um, yeah, the uh, the you know one of the issues with environmental quality incentives programs it is a reimbursement program. Um, it's less complicated than many uh, grants because folks don't have to develop their own um, their own budgets uh, and and they know going into the program what they will be reimbursed. But one of the issues is often the the startup costs now. Um, actually, it was under the, the previous farm bill um, language was added that individuals who apply for uh, equip funds can get uh, up to 50% of the costs of uh, um, a, uh, a practice um, in advance of the, of the practice. There are guidelines uh, and requirements, um, you know, to make sure that once the money is uh, dispersed that the individuals are you know are moving towards completion of uh, of, of the practices um, but that at least is you know is a start and I know with many resource poor tribes um, you know 50 percent uh, you know it's still only about halfway there um, but it often is it's an it should be enough hopefully to get the materials necessary to put um, put the projects in the ground so I, I hope that helps um, yeah, that's I, a great can question. I, 
Christy, did oh, you want to elaborate on that at all? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, just to take another step further, I believe um, in the new iteration here of the Farm Bill that NRCS, we're supposed to um, actually tell you when you're applying that the advanced option is there. Prior Farm Bill, we didn't uh, do that necessarily, but now um, your planner should should notify you when you apply that there's the opportunity for an advance. That's all great news. And I just want to remind everybody on the call that, you know, the Intertravel Ag Council is here to serve as an additional technical assistance network. So if there are uh, particular questions uh, or you know people that would like to get involved in implementing conservation projects, but you are concerned with the upfront cost of getting those implemented, please reach out to us and we may be able to connect you with additional um, regional or local opportunities that would exist to be able to help cost share or, or front the financial aspect of the conservation implementation. There was another question on the line and I can't necessarily speak to it myself, but I'm hoping one of our panelists can. Aquaculture was mentioned. Um, what examples of projects so, or support has occurred or is currently occurring as it relates to aquaculture? Um, so I, I know of in, in Wisconsin, um, there, there has been some work with, uh, with tribes and traditional aquaculture ponds. Um, something that uh, folks need to bear in mind with NRCS funds is that uh, NRCS provides technical assistance and funds um, to, uh, to apply practices to address resource concerns. So um, we, we wouldn't help start a new agricultural enterprise like, like building aquaculture ponds, for instance, but if uh, the aquaculture ponds, there were existing aquaculture ponds that had, um, you know, they, they had trouble with uh, uh, loss um, of, of water because the, the ponds We might have lost Pedro. I think we lost Pedro, yeah. Um, but I, I want to just kind of build upon what he started to say there and, you know, recognize that because of the design of some of these programs, potentially not every single practice is something or the transition to every single practice is something that can be uh, utilized uh, for, for NRCS specific funding. So it's critical to engage in the conversations, to start to devise the plan and identify what it is that's going to be done. And then once the plan is, is in place, make sure that you're sticking to the plan so that all of the program dollars can flow the way that the plan was designed for. Pedro, were you able to join us again? I don't think so. I think I'm on my personal, uh, iPad, I, but my network with my government computer is acting up, so. Oh, gotcha, okay. <laughs> As of right now, those are all of the questions that have come in through the Q&A and the, the webinar chat features. Um, we'll go ahead and, and give it one more minute if, if anybody does have a question to send it in. Um, Kier, would you flip back one more time to the Farm Ranch Help page? So just as a reminder, while we wait for any last minute questions to come in, um, the Intertribal Ag Council is doing the best that we can to capture a look into how COVID-19 is impacting farmers and ranchers across Indian country. And we're trying to develop as much transparency and insight as we can. Please visit indianag.org slash farm ranch help to learn how you can help to support our native farmers and ranchers. Whether you're involved as a land steward yourself you are a farmer or a rancher, you're a community member and a general food consumer, or you're involved within a tribal government or working for an organization or business, please visit this uh, website to learn about ways that we've already offered uh, guidance in, in directing your voice to make sure that there's going to be some support available to those that are tasked with such an important job of caring for our lands and our food systems. 
Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, requested that you share your stories with us. We want to know um, from hear from tribal producers, community leaders, community grocers, and food companies. Um, we it's a five minute survey. We have begun doing a two hundred dollar prepaid Visa gift card giveaway every week. Um, so we would love to hear from you. We'd love for you to be entered into that drawing. And we're going to start um, publishing some of the results from these surveys to just really get a comprehensive look into how COVID-19 is impacting our communities and the ways that we are working with our partners nationally in order to um, address some of these needs and ensure the regeneration of a, a better, stronger food system. Pedro, it looked like you had gotten kicked out. Um, and if you would like to go ahead and recap on that answer in which you got kicked out. Uh, yeah, I apologize. I don't know where I, I lost you, but um, I, I guess the, the question was where is, uh, are, is NRCS working with uh, folks on aquaculture and, and what kind of practices it looks like? Um, the, you know, it, I know of, uh, of projects in Wisconsin with uh, aquaculture um, where the the tribe had existing aquaculture ponds that uh, the, the lining um, of these ponds was caused uh, was um, was old and, and deteriorated and so it was causing the, uh, the, the the ponds to lose a lot of water from from uh, from leakage so they were able to see a resource concern of inefficient water use and so uh, in, in, in an instance like that, NRCS could go in and help uh, reline the ponds. Um, we wouldn't go in and, and start a new agricultural system. Um, there's also instances in, in, um, uh, in Washington, um, not so much in an aquaculture scenario, but Oh no, I'm worried we lost him again. I'm gonna go ahead and connect Pedro and Siobhan uh, offline <clears throat> via email um, so that they can go ahead and, and continue to carry on the conversation specific to aquaculture. Uh, there was one more question that did roll in. Uh, a restoration ecology student that's graduating soon, how would you be able to get involved in either the NRCS or IEC in restoration planning? Um, that's a phenomenal, question. Uh, we would love to hear from you via email so we can touch base with you and let you know of the upcoming opportunities that we're available, um, that we know that are available to our young professionals and um, would love to figure out ways that we can help support you in the next step of your career. We're really excited to hear that you're going to be graduating soon and that you're interested in a career in restoration planning. Uh, congratulations to you. With that, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to everybody who hung in there with us. We know that this webinar went a little bit longer. We kind of expected that given that we had more um, attendees uh, this week uh, registered than, than we've been seeing. So thank you for staying on the line with us and hanging in there. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to Kier or myself. And like I said, we will be getting this recorded webinar posted on our YouTube channel so that you can refer back to any of the information that was shared with you today. Thank you all so much. And to all the presenters, uh, thank you so much for getting on and, and sharing a little bit about your projects and the work that you do. <clears throat> it wouldn't have been the same without you. So thank you for your efforts.